Let's do an experiment. I want you to take a look at this color. Is it more red or more blue? Now to give you a hand, I'm gonna give you a scale from very red to pretty red to neutral to pretty blue to very blue. Where would you rate this color? How about this one? Very red, very blue. How about this one? I'm actually just gonna group these into two categories and call one of them Queenslanders and the other one Victorians. And I want you to rate how blue or how red these colors are. Have a look at this Queenslander. Very red, very blue. How about this Victorian? How about this Queenslander? How about this Victorian? You starting to see a pattern here? Take a look at these two. Take a look at this Queenslander and this Victorian. You know, if you're like most people, a funny thing just happened in your brain. Just because you started associating Queenslanders with the redder ones and Victorians with the bluer ones, you actually thought that this Queenslander looked more red and this Victorian looked more blue. And the funny thing is, they're the same color. See, just by putting these into two groups, just by setting some expected characteristics, your mind can start to exaggerate the differences between these two groups, or even make up differences when they're not even there. This is just one experiment which demonstrates a theory by Henri Tajfel, a social psychologist from the 1960s. You see, our brains are wired to work with a stereotype of what a thing should be. Bees are stingy, you should avoid those. Milk is drinky, you should drink it. But those stereotypes aren't always true. There are bees which don't sting and some milk you really shouldn't drink. But what happens when these categories start getting put on people? When we put human beings into groups, we can develop stereotypes. We can develop concepts of us and them, of the in-group and the out-group. And that's when we start to have trouble because stereotypes can build and build, causing us to find differences in people like us and people not like us. And with human beings, the groups we put people in can be pretty rational. Here's an example. Have you ever been asked the question, where are you from? Well, let's just see how ridiculous that question can get. Go with me here. I live in America, but I used to live in Australia. But before that, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I'm from Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm from Hong Kong. That's where I'm from. My dad is from Hong Kong. He was really from Hong Kong, or I guess, you know, really his dad was from Australia, but his dad was really, really from Britain because his great-great-grandfather was a convict, so we're British, but he married someone Irish, so does that make us Irish? And his kids married people from Germany, but they were really from France, which became part of Germany, which then is part of France again today, so we're French. Oh, and my mom's from England and Scotland. But even though she's from Scotland, she's part of a clan, which is really French originally, because they have a French motto with literally a French typo in it. But if you're really from Scotland, there's a good chance you're actually a result of the Viking invasion into Northern Europe. So maybe you're from Norway? But then if she's really from England, then if anyone's from England, then there's a good chance they're actually French because the Normans invaded in 1066 and made the official language of England French for 200 years. But if you really, really were from England, like before the French, then you're probably speaking a language called Old English, which is like English just without all of the French bits. And really that's kind of like Anglo-Saxon, which is from Germany, so maybe you're German? And if you're not any of those, and you're really, really from Britain, from you know around the time of Stonehenge, then the evidence shows that you're really from Belgium anyway. But those people were invaded by the Romans, so that makes you Italian. And if you're just generally from Europe, then chances are your family moved to Europe about 20,000 years after Australia was first settled. Fun fact, when humans arrived in Europe, turns out they weren't alone. Our genetic cousins, Neanderthals, were already living there. And if you're a European, chances are 2% of your DNA is actually Neanderthal DNA, you know, because your ancient ancestors and your ancient genetic cousins became friends. And if you're European, you're just one part of this huge story of human migration. Your family came from Central Asia, 
and before that the Middle East. And it's in the Middle East that so many paths come together. People from North and South America, the Pacific and Asia all found a home in the Middle East. Modern day Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan and Syria. That was home for so many of us. And all of us, every one of us, can trace our family back to the cradle of humanity, likely somewhere in East Africa. Now I wonder if you can trace that journey for your own family. Maybe 5,000 years ago, your forebears were part of the great Polynesian migration. Maybe your great-great-grandmother, 10,000 years ago, walked across a land bridge during the last ice age to settle North or South America. Maybe your great-great-uncle moved from China to inhabit Southeast Asia 20,000 years ago, or perhaps 50,000 years ago, your family moved to West Africa. Or if you're an indigenous Australian, you're the proud owner of the oldest continuous culture in the world, because 60,000 years ago, your family migrated through the coast of Asia to call Australia home. In each of our histories is the story of migration, is the story of human movement. So when you next get asked, where are you from? Just remember that no human is from just one place. No human is part of just one group. And the differences between us can be so easily exaggerated. Our histories demonstrate that old truth that we are all connected, that we share the same stories of struggle, the same hopes for our future. We share the same origin. Our stories start together. So today we have a choice to define each other by where we're from or to stop thinking in terms of us and them. Because right now, for so many people, that matters so much. We are living through the largest humanitarian crisis the world has seen since the Second World War. From brutal civil wars in Syria and Yemen, to droughts and floods in East Africa, to hundreds of thousands fleeing violence and persecution in Myanmar. The United Nations is telling us about the number of people fleeing crises like we've never seen before. People are on a journey. People looking for shelter. People looking for safety. People looking for a safe place to call home. Our stereotypes can lead us to think that people seeking refuge and asylum are far more different from us than they actually are. And we have to decide how to respond. To think in terms of them and us, or to act with humanity to people just like us, whose paths we share, whose histories are our own, who live on earth, our common home.